<coughs> Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking um, about the work we've been doing in Oxford, um, which is essentially looking at ways to um, innovate the acute care pathway. Um, now, the future is a very, very busy space at the moment. Everyone's talking about, as you can see, Royal College of Physicians, with this rather apocalyptic cartoon of how acute medicine feels like at the moment, and primary care feels much the same way. These are systems very much under a lot of pressure, increasing day by day and year by year. And the response of, 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 sort of in terms of primary care workforce and the NHS England's five year forward view. A lot of these are calls to um, create changes in urgent care we've been thinking about and talking about him up this morning. So, um, this is a journey of disruptive innovation in the acute care pathway um, and involves um, a real example of hospitalists working outside hospital walls. Um, as we created what we felt at the time was how we we're going to change our community offering. Um, and this was to disrupt the existing acute care pathway for adult medicine with a focus on older patients who live with frailty. But if it works for older patients with frailty, it works for everybody. Um, and realising we need a different kind of community physician, a physician based in the community that can still take a generalist holistic view of a patient but also handle granular acute medical risk. Um, and then as we'll see, we've had managed to take that learning back <coughs> and change how an acute hospital runs. It's important when we innovated that we did it away from the kind of traditional hawks in a big tertiary academic centre. And then once we knew what our minimum viable product was, we could then move it back more secure uh, into the hospital. More of that and not. But our critical focus really was trying to improve the patient and care experience of acute illness and, and re hopeful recovery from acute illness too. So what is ambulatory emergency care? Well, this is what the RCP thinks it is from the Future Hospital Commission. Um, so it's the things we recognise in medicine, diagnosis, observation, treatment um, and rehabilitation, but not provided from the traditional bed base or from outpatients. It's a new platform, a new configuration of care. Critically, in these observation periods, are patients getting better or not? Rapid diagnostics, so we can understand what's wrong with the patient pretty much as soon as healthcare knows they're unwell or there's a problem. Um, and the decision makers really up front in the process. Traditionally, we have been kept far behind in the process, certainly from the hospital perspective, but it's what GPs been doing for years, the decision maker sees the patient first. Um, and the RCB had makes these bold claims. It improves patient experience, it reduces a negative impact of emission, and it's cost effective. We may think that, but the evidence is actually relatively sparse on that, and that's kind of what I'm doing as well, to understand what are the improvements there and how can they be optimised. So our first forehead to this was the Emergency Multidisciplinary Unit, the EMU. Um, and the, the, the feed was really just very accessible for community, rapidly responding, um, but offering that multidisciplinary diagnosis and treatment that the contemporary older adult who's unwell requires in order to understand everything that's wrong and provide an optimal tailored treatment. This isn't a language of loss. It's not about you're not going to hospital. It's a language of gain. You get to be at home and we understand what's wrong with you. So it has to be a credible alternative hospital admission. And that means replicating some of the processes of care that happen in the acute hospital, but doing it outside. It's got to be credible to clinicians, critically credible to patients and carers as well. Otherwise, it's a language of loss and you've lost. It's not, I think this is very much a language of gain. It allows us to personalise an acute care process, tailored to risk. Um, and I'll explain a bit more about that as we go. Um, but critically, patient and care preference for location of care are very strong voices in this. Um, and ultimately, it allowed us as an organisation um, to have a platform for innovation in care and understand how the organisation learns. People are very risk averse, understand this is patients that we're dealing with, um, but it allows the organisation how to learn and to innovate in a way that's comfortable for it. So this pathway for disruption starts uh, here in Abingdon, which is a small market town to the south of Oxford. Um, and our whole idea was, well, we'll have acute assessments delivered by interface physicians. These are both GPs or hospitalists who are comfortable in the acute ambulatory out of hospital space. We did this in a, in a community hospital initially because it's got co-located services that were quite handy for us. There's plain x-ray. Um, there are <coughs> post-acute care walls that are maybe fed from the John Radcliffe up here, um, hip fracture pathway, stroke pathway, genetic rehabilitation pathway. Um, and the, traditionally, that community hospital has also had a strong relationship with acute trust. So this is the acute trust staff coming out to deliver um, a, a new unit in a bit of re-engineered space embedded in a community that had a bit of infrastructure around it. So we've very much benefited from that. Um, so who's on the shop floor? Uh, it's all the people that you need for contemporary acute care really. Nursing, physiotherapy, OT, social work, a man in a van who can go and retrieve a patient and the GBs on a home visit and bring you to us. So we're not relying on ambulance transport or hospital transport. And this medical interface capability. 
So we were thinking that we need a different kind of physician for this. This is um, it's not traditional general practice work, it's not traditional hospital work, but it blends the best of both, we think. The ability to um, understand how illness is dealt with in the community, the ability to understand the whole person and take the person into account, but also to understand how do you manage, um, diagnose and investigate um, the range of acute medical illnesses and make an assessment about actually can we do this on that hospital pathway. And for me, a lot of that is down to the rapid diagnostics that we have, and that's what releases this whole change of how we've managed to change our process of care. So what's the workflow? Um, well, the top line here, you imagine there's an acutely unwell, older adult living with frailty who's at home or a care home, found to be unwell, either by primary care, by a paramedic or a community team, or a family member who typically some come around to see mum or dad first thing in the morning, found they've been unwell overnight. Um, they refer to EMU, that's a direct clinician to clinician referral um, and then dedicated transport goes retrieves the patient unless there's an ambulance on the scene they'll bring them to us and then the uh, EMU assessment and treatment but, very much, but the diagnostics are very much an upfront part of that so by the time that the assessing clinician sees the patient yes there's been a nursing assessment and other bits and pieces have been done but we've got a full physiological profile of what's wrong with the patient and then either they could go home then to come back the next day typically so we look after people on an, on an epoch of care so it's not just one shot and go home it's care over several days, very much replicating what would happen on the hospital ward. Um, we also have a community hospital bed, so these are cheaper to staff than the acute hospital beds. Um, and again, the point of care diagnostics allows us to safely manage patients outside of an acute bed base when they have an acute illness. A case, of course, we'll find there's a significant acute illness there that wasn't really obvious to the first contact healthcare provider. But because the physicians who work in this unit are plugged into the hospital, we can then rapidly arrange ongoing care and not go direct to a bed rather than going via ED. So it's a better process of care for the patient end to end. Okay, so this hasn't come out brilliantly, I'm sorry about that, it's, it's, it's been put onto the generic slides. But essentially, the point of care bloods that we have, you use the Abbott ISTAT, so we have full electrolytes, you have troponin, um, blood gases and lactate, port for the sepsis pathways. Um, although we don't see patients who have a sort of classical acute coronary syndrome, we know that ischemic heart disease comes up with breathlessness, and a lot of our patients are breathless, so we also have troponin as a point of care test as well, and CRP, and plain x-ray. So while we don't often... Um, we don't have cross-sectional imaging on site, um, but the fact is, again, it's very simple for us to arrange um, some cross-sectional imaging, CT or MRI, or on a scheduled basis, rather than having sort of pile into ED to access that as diagnostics as well. And we offer what's called sort of interface multidisciplinary team care, so it's the, the, the therapists who are able to sort of help, help patients regain their function whilst the, the medics and the nurses control the underlying illness. Um, and we do the things that you can see done on hospital wards, so we can give intravenous fluids, we take fluid away with diuretics, we can control infection with antibiotics, or we'll give supporting blood products. And we can coordinate um, ongoing investigations as well to manage an, an, uh, the, an acute problem that's actually a manifestation of, a, of, of, a, of another disease process that's just reared its head. And we can monitor and, and frequently as we like. So come back today, come back tomorrow, come back in three or four days' time, it's a seven-day service. So once people are plugged in, we can then calibrate and tailor um, our ongoing monitoring to patients. And our care path is rather ambulatory, um, so as I said, they go home and come back, home and come back, which could be their home or a care home, um, or we have a community bed-based care or acute. So the whole thing rests in our diagnostics, really, our ability to manage risk outside of an acute environment. On the right is, this is the um, alirophenia, which is our CRP, and on the left is the, um, the um, Abbott ISTAT. Um, and it's essential, it's, it's pretty simple really. You just you know, undo the cartridge, stick it in, put a bit of blood on, and then in a couple of minutes you've got everything that takes an hour and a half in the hospital to find out. So it's, it's giving, it, there's a nice narrative here because we're taking the best of tech, direct technology um, and we're helping treat people who often have quite, um, quite a quiet voice in healthcare. So we're kind of turning things on their head. These are the people who are demanding it, we're saying, no, you're worth it, you're giving it because you're worth it. So it's a nice narrative around that. But um, doctors are, can be quite conservative beasts. And getting them to believe that this £5,000 handset is the same as a multi-million pound benchtop ABBA analyzer um, is, is, is quite different. So um, we have some really helpful um, laboratory team, very supportive of point of care, and they run a bake-off for us, where basically you get the blood, you have the, ha the handset and the, the multi-million pound benchtop stuff, and we run at the same time, and they're equivalent. So once that information comes out, the physicians will then start believing the point of care result and not think I need to get a parallel sample to the lab just to be sure to know what the real answer is. No, no, this is the real answer. Use it in the field. 
And we've done some clinical validation tests because one of the problems with those lab bake-offs is you have, very, you have expert biomedical scientists who understand quality control um, using these two tests to say it works, whereas actually it's being done by people like me um, who aren't trained as a, as a lab scientist and I might take the blood summer then answer the phone and sort of to do something and I haven't quite, uh, quite stuck to this, this standard operating procedure for how that blood should be sampled and analysed. So again, allowing for the robustness, uh, they have to be robust for the acute busy ambulatory environment where it's not going to go according to plan, stuff's just going to happen, will it work? And the answer is this is a, uh, one of our um, uh, regression lines for creatinine saying that the um, point of care creatinine absolutely matches a lab creatinine completely. And that's from someone like me taking it whilst trying to look after patients at the same time. So very robust point of care platforms. So we believe them. So what patients do we see? So this is some work we did looking at just over 500 consecutive referrals. Median age 80, half the patients were older than 80. Most were female, women live longer than men. Um, and um, independence, uh, not that independent a group actually. So although you know, um, around 90% were living at home, 40% were alone, but a quarter of them had a care package supporting them. Most get fed by paramedics, but you know, the average Bartel score measure of dependency um, uh, was 16.7. It's indicating that these are people who have a significant number of ongoing care needs as well. So it's a frail dependent population. What do they come in with? Half of them, it's, it's um, just not quite right today. Decreased mobility, functional decline. Mum's just not quite right. Not sure what this is. The acute frailty syndromes of functional decline, falls and confusion. But in terms of symptom-wise, our number one symptom is breathlessness. And that's what we're going to do. So you would think, what? What package of point of care tests or other investigations do you need to handle your kind of your, your kind of your, your big giants? And for us, it's the, the acute frailty syndromes and breathlessness are, captures most of our group. So what happens next? Well, uh, anyone can stand in the hospital and say, "Go home." There you go. You've, anyone can run an ambulatory unit by saying, "Well, I think they can go home." So the number of patients who go home the same day, I think, is a very poor marker of quality of care in ambulatory care um, because anyone can do it and get it wrong. I think a, a high quality ambulatory care service picks the right patients and can support them on an ambulatory pathway at least for the next month after their index assessment. So um, we look at pathway outcomes at 30 days after we've seen them or someone said this patient's unwell. Um, and so 60% remain on an ambulatory pathway. This is patients who um, you know, older, frailer, with acute medical illnesses. And 60% are, we are managed entirely outside any kind of bed, whether community or hospital. So about one in ten, we try an ambulatory pathway, often because that's patient care preference, and we say, look, we're not winning. We think we need some form of bed-based care here because we're not getting this right. Um, and about one in five, we could admit to community hospital beds, manage the acute medical illness again with our daily senior view and targeted use of um, public care diagnostics without needing to go anywhere near an acute medical bed. But 10% end up being transferred. Not all that's for, um, for acute medical, some of it's because actually we need a bed based pathway care, we don't have a community hospital bed to hand. But um, essentially, we manage the bulk of the patients that we see without going anywhere near an acute hospital bed. And that's many, I think, down to the combination of the multisomy team, the seniority of who's making the decisions, and the fact that we've got access to this suite of point of care diagnostics so as to handle risk. So how do we take this into an acute hospital and change a big beast of a tertiary academic centre? Well, you start with data. So what I have here, um, are, so each of those diamonds is a consultant. And what we do is at four years' worth of their takes, medical takes, acute, acute medical take. And I, the question was, look at all the patients that you're referred on the day that you're on take. What percentage of patients go home within 12 hours of being referred? Now, we all have, we, we're all on a continuum of risk, whether we work in hospital, whether we work in community. There are some clinicians in community and some in hospital who just have different risk thresholds. And we work, at the, we work at the level that allows us to get a good night's sleep and come back and do the same job the next day, and to do that for 30 years. So I'm not saying we change people, I'm saying we have to understand how we vary and how that impacts on our systems. So here we can see that there are some consultants who are comfortable managing 50% of their patients on an ambulatory basis. And there are some that manage 10% on an ambulatory basis. And, that's, and the nice thing about this is it's basically a randomised trial, because patients don't choose the day they're ill. Over four years, it's pretty much a random allocation of patients and illness and consultants. This variation is even bigger in primary care in terms of referrals. So, we, so I'm, not saying this is, I'm not making any comment about the, the, the tribe of doctor. I'm saying this is about human beings. But if we, don't, if we ignore it and don't understand it, we don't understand how we can change our systems. So that, this data is our kind of mandate. Well, maybe we need to have a standardised ambulatory offering. I know Keith was talking about not wanting to have units and having more about processes, and I think he's right. 
Um, but you've got to start somewhere, and having a unit of people who are happy doing that kind of work helps to embed the culture. That's what we did. So we wanted to increase the volume and scope of ambulatory care in the hospital, recognising that there was variation in, how, in, in the offering to patients. We wanted to improve patient care experience of illness, again, because there was a lot of congested spaces that patients are being seen in, and also to support the strategic direction of the STPs. Now, you either set up a unit, or we did what we did, which is we evolved. Two years ago, it started with me going into the ED, finding patients I thought shouldn't be there, finding a bit of a day hospital, taking them there, assessing and treating them, and then being able to send them home. Um, that worked, so they gave us three bedrooms on the geriatric ward and said, you can use these three for ambulatory care, hot bedroom during the day, we will keep them empty overnight. And you can get some nurses. And then a few months later, OK, you can have ten beds on the ward, because actually we, we weren't needing to admit so many patients. And then in the lab, over there, we were only kind of a few minutes' walk from the lab, they said, well, look, to get these patients care right, you need your point of care again, so embedded point of care diagnostics. And then in July, uh, they closed an entire medical ward and we opened it as a, an ambulatory assessment unit. We got our own junior staff and our footfalls massively increased. It says 20% there, but the slide's out of date, it's now much higher. So we basically managed to realign hospital resource towards um, ambulatory care from traditional bed-based care. Um, and so we're now the interface physician of the day, or iPod, I suppose that would be in terms of when pill works. Um, we take all the medical referrals, and what we can't handle, we send to the traditional bed-based medical take. We talk to paramedics, they don't have to come to casualty. Um, we want to kind of have the calibrated offering. Does this patient need to go to resus, majors, bed-based medicine, or us? So by ringing us direct, we can have an honest discussion with a referrer and offer the patient as well and work out where should they be in our system of offering. So what have we achieved? Well, like everyone else, this top red line is a, these are number of patients per month. And like everyone else, the last sort of year or so, we've had a, you know, a huge increase in amount of acute medicines. This top red line is the amount of total patients being referred to medicine. This is us here, and that when we open there and how we've grown. So, and this blue one is the traditional medical, medical take. So essentially what we've done is we have absorbed a lot of the increase in referrals and allowed medicine to flatline and stay within its within its medical bed base, as it were, or actually a shrunk bed base. We had increased referrals and we managed to take a whole ward out by realigning people, by changing the culture, um, and by transporting a, a model that we'd worked out more comfortable with in the community back into hospital. So it's sort of a, a, a reverse innovation. This isn't central going out. It's innovating in the community where it's more feasible than bringing it back into a more traditional place. It sometimes is change reverse. OK, these slides haven't come out, but essentially, which of what it's done here, I'll just skip over that one. But as I say, that we have a range of point of care diagnostics, but we need to move to the future as well to, to use, understand how we need to use um, point of care ultrasound as well to complement our blood work. Um, and this, what, I've done some research looking at patient care experience of acute ambulatory care. And this is a word cloud from an ethnography, which is uh, over 172 hours of observation on one of our units. And these are the patient's words. These are older, frail patients. And it's nice that right is the, the central word these words often it feels right for them it's right for them and they understand that and when this isn't a language of loss um, it's a language of gain really as i said before so what have we learned we've learned that point of care diagnostics they release a cascade of change of processes in care they allow doctors to work very differently um, and teams around them to work differently as well but we're still to do more work to understand that optimal combination um, of tests for both bloods and imaging uh, we use a lot of antibiotics on our unit and we, need, we have a um, um, and we know what our commitment is to antimicrobial stewardship. And so we're thinking what other tests that could be used, particularly procalcitonin, for example, point of care tests we're interested in using. So we want to expand the portfolio of point of care tests. Um, bring on point of care ultrasound as well. It's not just about blood, it's about imaging too. Um, but we are, we're pretty keen that we understand how these tests work in these environments as well. So those clinical validations are important. They give both patient carer and doctors confidence that they're getting the right answer. It helps them make a better decision first time. And ultimately, this allows us to calibrate our care models to risk and the patient and care of preference. So we've been able to say, actually, what is the risk here? What's the patient care and preference? And wrap a, a model around that, rather than having this as our standard offerings. Um, and that's been our journey so far. Um, but that's just not over yet. Um, just to say, I'm going to be moving next week to Birmingham, actually. I'll be uh, a professor of ambulatory care at the University of Birmingham from Monday. I mean, Britain's only professor of ambulatory care, maybe the only one ever, if it doesn't work out. But uh, we think there's a, a huge opportunity here. So. So I'll be having a focus as well as within Ox as well into the, into the West Midlands too. So hopefully I'll have a greater chance to talk and work with you over the years ahead. Thank you very much. Professor.